welcome everyone. Welcome Jessica, thank you for presenting in our seminar today. Um, Jessica serves as an executive director of ASAPBO, a research-driven nonprofit organization, working to promote uh, publishing in areas such as preprint and open peer review. And she's also an ambassador of Plan S. That's how we discovered. Uh, that's one of the reasons we discovered it. And uh, an affiliate of the Knowledge Futures Group and uh, in the steering committee of Rescuing Biomedical Research. But uh, I saw you also have some slides about all these interesting projects, so I, I let you. Thank you so much, Simi. And thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, I am excited to chat with you um, about you know, preprints and their interaction with open access, as well as get your perspectives on your own experience with publishing. So uh, just as a little bit of my background, my uh, kind of background is in cell biology, specifically uh, prokaryotic cell biology. I worked on bacterial polymers that uh, generate forces to move DNA or deliver toxins. And uh, you know, from a postdoc in synthetic biology, I then moved into this policy space by uh, working with really what started as just a, a meeting to try to encourage the use of preprints among our community. Um, and you know, I would just like to start, if I may, by launching a poll um, and getting a your you know perspective. Um, I think you know the the first question, especially, I think is. Uh, very relevant here, but I'm also curious to hear uh, from your the second question here too. Okay, we've got almost everyone has voted. I'll just maybe give it, maybe we can give it just a few more seconds, <laughs> last minute opportunity uh, to get your votes in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling if that's all right. Um, and perhaps I can share the results as well. So um, I think that this is you know very uh, interesting and I think it reflects um, I think sort of the standard in Biomedicine that um, about half of you have read preprints, um, but no, uh, no one um, in the audience it seems like has posted a preprint yet, which is great because I can you know hopefully have an opportunity to explain to you why uh, you might consider it and what the benefits are. And um, it certainly we'll get to this point about feedback on preprints being public or private um, at the closer to the end of, of the talk. Okay. So I am gonna uh, just go ahead and explain, you know, what what preprints are. I think that if uh, there are those of you in the audience who have read preprints, you may be aware of what they are. But effectively, the way that preprints are used today is that an author will post a preprint on a public server, and this can be before or after journal uh, submission, but it's usually around the same time. The manuscript is publicly available to anyone on the web free of charge, where it can be commented upon, the authors can be contacted, the work can be cited, and it can inform the work of other scientists. All during the months or possibly even years that that manuscript is under the peer review process. So all through this time when there's just a few peer reviewers who are exposed to the manuscript in a traditional process, the entire world has the opportunity to both scrutinize the manuscript and benefit from the knowledge inside. And overall, this accelerates the rate of communication about science. So this plot is from Europe PMC, which indexes preprints and has for quite some time. So they're very easy to find along with uh, published papers if you use Europe PMC. And there's a median of about four to five months between the posting of a preprint and the appearance of the subsequent journal article. So this means that during these 
four or five months, the entire scientific uh, enterprise can actually benefit and start building off of that knowledge. And if you think about uh, saving, you know, four to five months every time a paper is published, that can have real benefits in accelerating discovery. But the, the benefits of preprints are not only to the research enterprise as a whole, they also help individual researchers. So this is from a, a survey conducted by BioArchive. Uh, and I should say that there's a tiny URL that I can share with a link to these slides so you can click through and discover all these resources uh, as well. So the number one benefit that researchers cited, the authors of preprints cited, was that it increases awareness of the research. And so you can imagine there's this new content, it's online, it's fresh, it's, um, it's almost like going to a conference and seeing some really exciting new work that no one has ever talked about before. Preprints are where you can hear about research right when it's being released by the authors. And that also helps authors um, establish priority of their discovery. Uh, so, you know, there's, I think, certainly speaking personally, I spent a huge fraction of my graduate career or my postdoc worrying about if I was going to get scooped, um, especially while my paper was in review, going through review, um, and you know, it's not out, it's not public, no one can cite it during that time, but with a preprint, you can have your paper there where others can see it and cite it. So I think that especially because preprints are free to access, and we'll talk a little bit about the distinction between free access and open access, um, it really, I think, helps everyone in the world have access to your paper, even if they don't have a subscription to the journal, uh, if you do publish um, uh, in, a, in a venue that is not open. So this is something that I think is really, really valuable. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about preprints and open access publishing. Um, so while this talk primarily focuses on preprinting, um, I obviously am a huge advocate of open access as well. Um, and you know, preprints are an amazing tool for, uh, you can certainly use them to disseminate work um, that is really open access. And I would argue that um, not everything that is free online is truly open because in many of the early definitions of open access, um, there's also an emphasis on allowing others to reuse your work. That means translating it uh, and making derivative products, um, using a figure, um, in a review article, in a course. So that depends on how you license your work. Um, and we can certainly talk about this more if anyone is interested, but preprints allow you to put a Creative Commons license on your work that helps engage others and allow them to, uh, to share your preprint in much the same way. But preprints also, uh, when you post your preprint at a preprint server, such as BioArchive, you are allowing by signing uh, that license you are giving people the ability to text mine your preprint, which is really important for uh, building up a corpus of, of knowledge. But I don't think that uh, simply posting a preprint is uh, always a, a substitute for making your final paper open access. Um, and the reason for that is that many, most preprints don't change that much between the time that they're posted and when they appear in a journal, but some of them do. So this is an analysis that we did earlier in the year on COVID-19 preprints, which we'll talk about more later, as well as non-COVID-19 preprints. And so we saw like, the, you know, most of these preprints didn't really have much of a change in their figures. Let me see if I can get the pointer here. So most of these preprints didn't have a significant change in uh, the arrangement of the figures, but some preprints did add um, important contact content between the preprint and the final version. Um, and you know, in the abstract, um, many papers didn't change, but some of them had uh, large changes in the conclusions or softening or strengthening the conclusions. And so from this perspective, you know, we didn't analyze the entire paper, but um, Preprints do sometimes change between the time that they're posted and when they go through the peer review process. And journals have very different um, attitudes about when preprints can be posted. So for example, um, Nature Research says preprints can be posted at any time, which means that after receiving feedback from reviewers, you might notice that there's you know, a, um, 
an error and you can correct your preprint. But um, you know, some other publishers disallow this. And for this reason, um, open access um, is, is really important for both preprints and for published articles. OK, so what's going on with preprints now? Um, when I first uh, started, like I, when I, I published my first preprint, um, I think in 2014. But since that time, there has been this enormous growth in the preprints that are posted relevant to the life sciences. And this has been accompanied by lots of funder support for preprints. Um, and not only funder support, but also institutional support where preprints are appearing on Europe, PubMed Central, and you can now get the full text of preprints there too. Um, and so I, I think that, that it depends on um, uh, you know, individual institutional and funder policies, but there's been so much growing recognition for preprints as a valid form of scientific communication. And now they constitute about 8% of the volume of PubMed. So in other words, every month, about 8% of the volume of PubMed articles that are submitted are posted as preprints. And we do keep a list of funder policies that may be relevant to you with this URL. And you know, preprints have also played a huge role in COVID-19. So especially early in the pandemic, a large fraction of preprints were released um, you know, high at, at or the very early times, like almost equivalent to the number of journal articles. Um, and Med Archive has played the most significant role um, in this. So these are a list of different preprint servers. We can talk more about them if you wish. Um, but you know, probably the most well-known in basic biomedical sciences is BioArchive, and Med Archive is, I think, the most well-known in clinical sciences. And they've also been appearing in lots of uh, media reports. And you know, we've, again, following that analysis that I shared with you earlier, there's been so much unprecedented attention on COVID-19 preprints. They are being viewed, downloaded, cited, tweeted, uh, written about in news articles and blogs, like uh, you know, about 10 times as much as other articles. And so this has given us a situation where COVID, where preprints are not only advancing knowledge about COVID-19. For example, um, there were early reports from China that were posted as a preprint describing the clinical characteristics of COVID-19 patients. Um, there were uh, basically interactions of uh, proteomic studies that helped um, inform developments of potential treatments. There were reports about proning uh, and ventilator usage for patients that were all released as preprints prior to publishing. So, however, it's not only researchers who are looking at COVID-19 preprints, it's also the general public. And you know, we conducted a survey earlier in this year. Um, and, you know, certainly details are available, but just to say that this was mostly about you know, 500 researchers, approximately 500 people who are mostly researchers. And the biggest concern that people have about preprints this year is premature media coverage of preprints. So in other words, what if I post a preprint and it turns out that I'm actually wrong because you know, the whole point of preprints is that um, they're you know, released when the authors feel confident, but um, that it is prior to peer review. And you know, that's to say that peer review also is not infallible. Um, but you know, I think that there's a sense that as preprints are, are being released earlier in the research cycle, that it's possible that media coverage could draw attention to material that doesn't turn out to be correct. Um, and you know, again, this is the more general problem with science in general, that there's been a lot of media reports. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm often reading, especially in nutrition science, um, it seems like there's a lot of conflicting evidence that goes back and forth, even in the published literature. But all those concerns are really heightened um, with preprints, especially in this environment where uh, COVID-19 is creating this public health crisis. So just to say that we have an event um, that we will be announcing shortly. So this is a little bit of a preview about how to mitigate the challenges associated with public attention on preprints. And it's gonna be an online event on January 14th, and you can actually register uh, at the URL here if you're interested. But basically, how, how do we mitigate the potential harms of journalists covering a preprint 
um, or you know, basically uh, even conspiracy theorists getting a hold of preprints and extrapolating them to mean that um, the virus was engineered, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that in a few slides, but you know, I think it's really important that the nature of preprints and how they are screened is disclosed. So, you know, as I mentioned in that very first slide, preprints undergo a pretty brief screening procedure. And actually different servers have different screening procedures. Some preprint servers just check that the content isn't spam. But other preprint servers, uh, for example, MedArchive, do a pretty involved check to make sure that reporting guidelines are followed, conflict of interest disclosures are made, and the information, if it turns out to be incorrect, would not be harmful to the public. So I think that there's also a need for researchers to think about how to promote their research, and this applies both to researchers and press offices, um, and the use of review and commenting platforms as well. Um, so really just to go through this, um, you know, I think here's one example where I think um, all of the potential sort of fears and concerns about preprints um, were materialized, but at the same time, the benefits of preprints were also shown. So for example, um, th this preprint was actually posted in its first version on January 31st, uh, which by the way, was a Friday. Um, and this preprint basically claimed that uh, the, the uh, 2019, um, you know, the SARS-2 virus was actually similar in its sequence to HID. Feeding conspiracy theories about a potential human origin of the virus rather than a natural one. So this article um, received dozens of comments. So you can see here on this uh, second version, um, there were you know, 120 comments on this article. Um, and it was actually withdrawn um, like days later. <laughs> Um, which you know, I think is, is you can see here, this, this label um, indicates that. So within 48 hours, dozens of colleague, people, some of them colleagues had flagged this article as potentially problematic and the authors had chosen to withdraw the article. So that, contrasting that with a journal retraction process, I think this demonstrates that preprints are enabling not only rapid dissemination of ideas, but also the correction and modification of those ideas. So, you know, the versioning of preprints is something we haven't talked about a lot, but many times when issue, when problems are uh, identified within preprints, um, you can simply upload a new version to correct those problems. Um, and, by, you know, BioArchive and other servers offer a, com a way to add comments to indicate where you have done so. So this, I, you know, preprints allow corrections to work to be made faster. And of course, this is, I think, in a way, how science works. Um, but you know, preprints allow this to occur on a much more rapid scale. So amid COVID-19, I, I, there's a lot of text on this slide, but just to say that lots of funders, publishers um, have been calling for people to provide feedback on preprints. So for example, in that last slide, those 120 comments allowed people to understand, readers and the authors to understand the problems with their work. And so the more feedback that can be provided on preprints, the better. Um, and you know, again, from, from this survey earlier, um, most uh, people were, um, most authors were receiving comments, not necessarily on the commenting site of BioArchive, but through Twitter um, or other social media sites. And you know, just as an example of this, um, this is uh, certainly not a community that I'm personally a part of, but um, Daniel Quintana posted a methods paper um, to a uh, discussion group on Facebook and received this enormous response. And he tells a story about this, um, his experience with getting feedback on his preprint. So essentially, you can see this person is writing this enormously detailed response. Uh, and Dan actually um, invited this person to join as a co-author in revising the paper. 
And this led to a revision of the paper that uh, went on to be reviewed and published. So I think that you know, this is just an example of how the fact that preprints establish that you're open to a conversation can lead to new collaborations and, and not only fixing problems, but creating new connections. Um, specifically for COVID-19, which I think is important to talk about, there's been several different initiatives that have sprung up. Um, you know, I don't think we need to go into great detail given um, the, the time on this, but just to say that there's an organized group at Mount Sinai. So again, this is basically students and postdocs um, and some faculty as well, but who are really driving this project. They have an automated workflow and then they actually leave these very detailed comments on immunology COVID-19 papers. And Outbreak Science is another platform that provides a highly structured way of providing feedback about preprints. And Rapid Reviews COVID-19 is an MIT Press overlay journal that uh, basically provides reviews um, with or without author uh, agreement. And you know, I think part of the mission of this journal is actually to highlight content that might be problematic. So for example, there was a paper that was posted to Zenodo, which is a general data repository, um, which again claimed that uh, the uh, coronavirus had a human origin. Um, and um, you know, I think that the there's lots of um, issues with posting papers to Zenodo because there's no commenting section and there's no linkage to the comments. Um, but Rapid Reviews COVID-19 actually went and reviewed this paper, providing some context for people who are interested in learning more about what experts think about the paper, which is effectively that it should not, you know, has many methodological problems um, and is misleading. So we keep track of a different, uh, different types of review projects um, in this registry called Reimagine Review, which you can check out if you'd like to get involved in any of them. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a big tension here though. All of the feedback mechanisms and the benefits that I've been talking about so far accrue because the feedback is public. So if the feedback on that HIV, uh, coronavirus HIV paper, um, or the Yan report, the one on Sonoda that I just mentioned, had been private, um, it would be very hard for interested readers, journalists, to understand the public opinion of a paper. But again, in this um, survey conducted by Richard Sever and colleagues, the, um, the preferred form of feedback is, from, is by email and by talking to colleagues. And so, you know, in other words, the people I think prefer to have feedback privately as an author, but there's this tension between, of course, that's more, you know, perhaps easier to digest and, and more comfortable, but it also doesn't help potential other readers if there is context that needs to be put uh, on that paper. So maybe this is something that, you know, we can talk about a little bit more. It's a, it's a tension that has come up um, in, in the development of a, a project that ASAP Bio collaborates with EMBO on, which I'll just spend a few minutes talking about uh, to round out the talk. Review Commons is a platform that we have created attempting to reduce cycles of review, make the review more uh, transparent and make it more uh, constructive as well. So um, this is a quantitation of um, uh, the number of times that papers are submitted to different journals in order to be published. So almost half of papers are submitted to more than one journal before they're published. And um, when a paper is rejected, sometimes, um, you know, major publishers have large cascading systems where, for example, um, if you submit to Nature and get rejected, you, after review, you will be offered an opportunity to transfer your reviews to one of the journals inside that stable. But that, um, you know, it, it, review transfer does not work very well across different publishers. 
Um, and effectively, you know, authors may want to uh, really start the review all over again if they feel like that review has been focused on the fact that the paper is not sufficiently interesting, et cetera. Um, but the situation that we're in leads to about an estimated 15 million hours being wasted every year on re-reviewing manuscripts, or I should say on reviewing manuscripts um, where in, in cases where the reviews actually don't get taken into account um, in the final editorial decision. Um, and so we wanted to address this inefficiency, give reviewers more recognition for their reviews, and focus the reviews on the science rather than on the criteria of the journal. So uh, these reviews are uh, allow, review commons allows you as an author to create a refereed preprint. So for example, here's an example of a preprint. When you're on BioArchive and you're on one of these uh, preprints, you'll see this peer review tab on the side. And then by clicking on this, you can actually open this toolbar to see um, Embo has uh, through review commons posted referee reports and the author responses to those referee reports. And what happens is that after these reviews are received, um, the authors have the opportunity to select um, one of 17 partner journals to transfer their manuscripts to. So, uh, and, and authors can do this multiple times um, if their first choice doesn't work out, but the point being that, you know, not only do you have the option to post a referee preprint and show the review that has gone on your paper, but also that you can submit it to one of these partner journals uh, for formal publication. And all of these affiliates have agreed previously to not repeat review of the articles. So they will use the same reviewers and go back to the same reviewers. And I just want to mention here again, too much to cover in the slide, but um, Review Commons is one of several initiatives that offer review of preprints. There's also Peerage of Science, Peer Community In, and eLife Preprint Review. Um, eLife, just very um, excitingly, just a couple of weeks ago, announced that they are going to be reviewing preprints exclusively. So by submitting to eLife, you're basically, um, uh, it is, essentially required to post a preprint, which I think signifies that eLife is viewing itself as a uh, coordinator of peer review and a curator of research rather than as the primary venue through which work is first released to the public. So how is Review Commons working? Um, this is from a survey of Review Commons authors. Um, you know, a significant fraction of them found that reviews were more collegial and reviews improve the paper um, and the process was transparent. So, you know, I would say that there's, you know, several fold enhancement um, over the, the perception of this kind of, uh, these benefits that are traditional journal. Um, and it is also relatively fast. Um, so, you know, again, we are hoping that um, there would be not a lot of repeat of peer review by the affiliate journals. And that is certainly um, true, I think, um, you know, there we saw, especially for those manuscripts affected, accepted by affiliate journals, they had uh, almost, uh, you almost uniformly, no additional peer reviewers added. Um, but uh, only 30% of authors were electing to post their reviews on BioArchive, which I think gets back to this concept about the tension between the benefits for readers and the comfort of authors. Um, but what is motivating people to do so? I think that there's a lot of interest in supporting open science among those authors who decided to post their reviews alongside their preprint. But a uh, feeling like they needed more time to correct problems, <laughs> needed more time to correct problems in the manuscript for those who did not. So, with all of this, um, I just want to say thank you to my colleagues. Here's a link to the slides. Um, and I'm you know, really interested in hearing any questions that you might have. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you so much.